Okay, I think it's uh, time to get this town hall on the road. My name is Charlene Margo, and I'm the founder and director of the Parent Education Series, which is one of the projects funded by Sequoia Healthcare District. So we are delighted that you're joining us tonight for the inaugural town hall hosted by Sequoia Healthcare District. You're gonna be learning a lot tonight, both about the healthcare district and about mental health services that are provided in your schools and district represented by the mental health leads and mental health providers, I'm sorry, the wellness leads and mental health providers that are represented here tonight. Before we get into the heart of the program, just a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, there's gonna be a large group of us tonight and there's a large group of us presenters. So if you would attendees, please turn off your video and mute yourself so that ideally the only people on the screen will be the presenters. Okay, so if you are an attendee, please turn off your video and mute your audio. Then if you're new to Zoom, if you run your cursor across the bottom of the screen, you'll see a series of Zoom prompts. Tonight, we hope that you'll really make good use of the chat box. That's where you'll be able to enter your questions. So please do feel free to ask questions either as they come to you or later in the program for Q&A. And you'll also be seeing links that are going to be posted in that chat box throughout the night. Feel free to respond to those, ask questions, and you're gonna be having a few more interactive fun things to do. So this video will be recorded and offered later on the Sequoia Healthcare District website. So again, lots of detail. There's gonna be lots of information tonight. We're just so excited that you can join us again for the inaugural town hall hosted by the Sequoia Healthcare District. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Pamela Kurtzman the CEO of Sequoia Healthcare District and Dr. Karen Lee, Director of School Health for the district. Take it away, Pamela and Karen. Welcome everyone uh, to our inaugural town hall. It is wonderful to have you join us. Um, I had the idea of a town hall as a way for us to come together and to share information and to hear from our community members directly, especially during these times of collective trauma and uncertainty we need, I need, <laughs> to find solidarity and community in new ways. So and let's face it, uh, there is no playbook for what we're all experiencing. And while it is essential to physically distance from one another, it's also essential that we remain connected. Given that this is our first town hall, I'm going to spend a few minutes to tell everyone who we are for those who are unfamiliar with Sequoia Healthcare District. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. Give me a minute as I maybe fumble with that. Uh, it's not there for me <laughs> uh, in the moment. Um, okay. You know what? Um, I'm having technical issues. So you know what? I'm not gonna worry about that. Um, I'm going to be giving you some very high level information about the district and um, we, don't, we don't need the slides, it's fine. So um, first I wanna let everybody know, we are a local government agency. We operate much like a water district or a school district or a fire district, but our charge is health. We were formed in 1946 uh, to build and to operate Sequoia Hospital. And we were the first healthcare district in California. And now there are 78 healthcare districts across the state. Um, some own hospitals. We no longer own a hospital. We sold ours in 2007. And now we use our resources to uh, bring people health and safety and ironically, um, keep them out of the hospital. Um, we are governed by a five member board of directors who are elected by our residents and each board member serves a four year term and we currently have no term limits. My tiny but mighty team uh, has a background in academia and nonprofit administration in public health and in medicine and our district offices are located in Redwood City. I'm often asked, uh, where does your money come from? So our district receives the bulk of its income from a portion, it's 1.3% of uh, annual property taxes from residential and commercial properties within our boundaries. 
And the district covers central and southern uh, San Mateo. And the cities specifically are uh, Atherton, Belmont, Redwood City, San Carlos, um, Woodside, uh, and portions of Menlo Park, and uh, about a third of Foster City, and a small portion of San Mateo. There are approximately two, uh, 220,000 residents within our area, uh, according to the last census tract, which was actually 10 years ago. Um, you might also wonder what our budget is. So the district's annual budget's approved each June, and it's uh, approved by the Board of Directors. This year, our budget is close to 14 million, and it is our intention to put 100% of those dollars back out into the community. Uh, we primarily act as a funder, but we also run several of our own programs, including our Healthy Schools Initiative, which is our largest initiative of the district, and it comprises about a third of our budget. So that's a very high level overview of who we are. Um, what I'd like to do is just take a moment to get to know a bit about who is joining us this evening. Uh, I'm going to ask if you would uh, use your chat feature and um, let me know what city you're from. Uh, and then if you would also tell me how you're feeling tonight. Are you feeling anxious or are you feeling stressed, worried, or perhaps hopeful? And while you do that, uh, while you're chatting away, I'm going to share with you how I'm feeling today. And I'm kind of a glass half full kind of girl. So I'm, of course, going to uh, feel more on the positive side and I'm feeling determined. I am absolutely feeling determined. That's how I've been feeling. It's been pretty consistent. Um, and I think it's for all of us. Um, we just have so much at stake, but I believe that all of us can take an active role in shaping what we want versus the future that this pandemic hands us. And no matter who we are, I think um, every step that we take today as members of this community matters and every one of those steps are gonna add up once we get to the other side of this. And I know it's hard to see it now, but in time, the virus will fade and the sci-fi difficult moment that we are living in today is gonna to be behind us. But the memory of the choices that we made and how we showed up during this time won't, those won't fade. So as your healthcare district leader, I'm determined that, and we're determined as a district to not only keeping a steady focus on those urgent matters that are in front of us, but also gathering the energy and the precision needed to find and then to take the right steps toward tomorrow. And in the process, establish new resilience and stability for our community. So I see, I'm gonna check out the chat and see what kind of responses we have um, and how people are feeling today. So just give me a second as I scroll. So we've got uh, anxious and optimistic. I see two words that uh, are coming up in this theme. And it's anxious is definitely understandable. Um, I appreciate you sharing how you're feeling today. Um, we're just holding so much in our hearts and in our minds. And as we witness and we experience the devastating effects of this pandemic and now the wildfires and the smoke, it's really impacting our lives. And we all recognize that the negative effects are only compounded for those who are already vulnerable in our community. So I want you to know, uh, I've dedicated to continue monitoring the impact that these crises have on our community by listening to our residents and understanding their experiences and those of their friends and their loved ones, and to take actions that are gonna help our community recover and rebuild and heal. Uh, so now uh, I'd like to transition uh, over to the main reason you've really joined us tonight, and that's to learn how Sequoia Healthcare District is helping ensure access to mental health services for our students in the schools that we partner with um, particularly while children are struggling to learn remotely and teachers and school leaders 
are trying to figure out how to support children and families and to do so equitably. Our Healthy Schools Initiative was founded 10 years ago uh, on the belief that good health is necessary for academic success and that schools are an ideal venue for these health interventions. It's comprised of staff from each of our partner school districts who are called the wellness leads. And they are responsible for implementing the whole school, wait, I gotta get that, whole school, whole community, whole child model. It's this model the CDC um, recommends um, that, that looks at entire communities of schools, parents, teachers, and provides support through this model. Um, our funding directly supports over 60, that's six zero, full and part-time positions within these schools, including school nurses and counselors, mental health providers, uh, PE coaches, and whose role is to foster the healthy development of over 28,000 students in eight school districts across our region and some charter schools um, as well. And for the past two years, HSI has been led by Dr. Karen Lee, a former pediatrician and um, in private practice and is now our director of school health. So without further delay, I would like to introduce and hand this virtual mic over to uh, Dr. Lee. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Pamela. Thank you for um, your comments and the information. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that I feel very honored that the very first Sequoia Healthcare District Town Hall is focused on our school communities and on the, the families that have joined us tonight. So I, I really am happy that we're able to offer this town hall. And as Pamela mentioned, the Healthy Schools Initiative has officially reached its 10 year mark. Boy, does time fly. And um, Pamela created this program back in 2010 and quickly expanded the program from its original four school districts to now eight, eight school districts. Um, Pamela mentioned that our budget is about a third of the Sequoia Healthcare District budget, which amounts to $4.5 million every year. Um, and that provides funding, as she mentioned, for positions like wellness coordinators and nurses and mental health supports and other critical needs within our schools. The current ongoing crises, um, which there are many right now, um, have brought to light how essential these needs are as schools and families um, navigate through these difficult and challenging times. So our strategy, um, we certainly are focused on supporting students' well-being, but we also focus on the influential adults in their lives. So folks like all of you, the parents, um, for instance, through our community outreach program, such as Charlene Margo's Parent Education Series, and also support for teachers and school staff. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more later about the social emotional support that we are providing to, to educators and the suicide prevention and the diversity and equity and inclusion trainings for educators. So we're really hitting those three levels, the adults, the, the educators, the parents, and of course the students. So for the past several years, We've also focused on alcohol, tobacco, and other drug issues. And most recently, we've been addressing the um, concerns about vaping, the e-cigarette use among our youth in the, in the community. We also use the funds to help support a Healthy Schools Grants Program. And annually, we commit between a quarter to a half a million dollars to our community nonprofits that help help um, in the schools. So it's, it's a very comprehensive program and um, we're just happy you're here to learn about it. Um, now we're going to hear from all of you and our panelists. Um, mental health has been a top priority since the beginning of the Healthy Schools Initiative, but we want you to hear today what support currently exists in schools and our community at large especially during these stressful times. Our panelists include health and wellness leads from our eight school districts. And you'll also hear from four of our mental health experts from our partner agencies that serve our schools. 
Um, I want all of you to note that a resource list with contact information will be sent to all of you who registered through Eventbrite. And so you'll have that information um, at your disposal by tomorrow. So each of our panelists will now take um, a couple of minutes to introduce themselves and provide a brief overview of their work in the mental health space. So I will call on the panelists one by one. Um, I'll start by stating a name of the person who will introduce themselves and then the next person who will be in line. So we'll start with Javier Gutierrez and next in line will be Andrea Guerin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us and your interest in learning more about the healthcare district and what our local school districts uh, provide. So I work with the Sequoia Union High School District. I'm the health and wellness coordinator um, and want to just make sure that we all know at Sequoia Union High School District, we're committed to supporting our students. Uh, we have mental health services available at uh, all of our schools, either directly from our staff uh, and or through our partners who are also here tonight. So appreciate our partners here. Um, and usually uh, they, our students access this either through self-referring or uh, getting referred by a staff member. And you know, oftentimes that's easier to do in person, but even in this virtual setting, uh, the interaction that our staff have with students and um, the communication that's taking place still allows our staff to identify when students might need additional support. Um, and so there is still staff referrals occurring, but any student can always reach out to uh, a trusted adult on campus, whether it's a teacher, a counselor, or directly with our mental health staff. Um, and we have uh, individual counseling. We also have group counseling available. Uh, I encourage you to, if you have a child in our school, um, to check with your school. Um, or our district website to contact someone at the schools um, and, and understand that there are groups available um, and there's individual counseling available as well. Like I mentioned, uh, we have our mental health staff at our four comprehensive high schools and all of our schools have counselors available and all of our schools also have uh, partner support available. Um, we've also been providing a, a student app that our students can access for free. Uh, we're trying to expand our social emotional learning uh, capacity and access for students to have that. And uh, we also have parent education available. So there are great resources on our website uh, for students, for parents, and for the community to learn more about what we have going on at Sequoia Union High School District. Excuse me, I was muted. Um, thank you, Javier. Next, we have Andrea Guerin. And after Andrea, we'll have Mindy Hilt. Hi, thank you, Karen. I'm Andrea Guerin. I'm the Director of Health and Wellness in Redwood City School District. And, um, you know, in terms of the climate right now around mental health, I would say that, um, honestly, I'm, I'm a little concerned. I'm, I'm a little concerned about some of the the, um, the, the stressors on our, on our students and our families. And where I'm very um, optimistic is that we have now got a lot of services in place and a lot of these partnerships that we've built over so many years. And our first counseling program started, I guess about seven years ago now, and it started with um, money from the healthcare district. And we were able to take that money and we were able to get schools to contribute and expand the program. And every year since the program has expanded and expanded and expanded. And now where we've even increased, you know, our partnerships and we've the school districts um, now also adding money. And so um, I think it's, it's really, I'm very hopeful that we can provide these services to kids that we can support them. And this year, um, what I'm noticing with this pandemic is this shift because in the past, kids are at school and we have eyes on kids at school. So the communication would go from school home. Well, now kids are home and suddenly the communications shifted the other direction where now the, the families are reaching out to the school. 
And sometimes um, that communication is going directly to a teacher or to a principal. And sometimes it's the kids themselves. They're, they're communicating with their teachers. They're communicating through email or through chat. And, and so then that, now it's a little, it's a shift. And so what we're working on right now in Redwood City is we're really trying to hone the processes because there has been that shift. And we're trying to make sure that we're able to connect with kids who need support very directly. We have a link for parents to request services when they have a concern. And we're working, we have a, a very large meeting coming up on Monday actually, with just the administrators and our staff to try to really walk through the step-by-step -step process. And that's part of our green folder project that um, was developed years back, and I'm, Karen will be talking more about that later, but the green folders are suicide prevention protocol that's built up off the county protocol. And so we're really working on our processes this year, and it's been incredible. We've had amazing um, interest and in, in, um, motiva motivation. Everyone's extremely motivated this year, especially because we know the need is so great. So um, we also have very motivated parents. We've had lots of parent input and I'm very encouraged. Um, I think that we're gonna create things, and Pamela said this earlier, I think we're gonna create things now that are gonna serve us into the future. And so as, as hard as this year is going to be and has been in many ways, I do feel very optimistic about what we're creating now. And um, I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, next, we have Mindy Hill, and to follow Mindy, we'll have Kristen Sevilla. Hi, everyone. My name is Mindy Hill. I'm the wellness lead for San Carlos. And, um, you know, I've been in this position for almost nine years now. So, like Andrea, we've really seen the support from the community grow, especially from the healthcare district um, and, and from our own teachers, their capacity has really grown. Um, the programs that have been put in place have helped us really build out the three tiers of mental health support. Um, you know, we're thrilled that we have four full-time school counselors serving our eight schools. Um, we're thrilled that we have a, a very strong partner in One Life Counseling Services. They support, they're currently supporting six mental health associates in our schools. So when kids come to us, what we're seeing just in these first three weeks of school is we've had about 60 one-on-one um, -on -one contacts with students who are experiencing anxiety, issues with personal development, issues with stress management. And, it, you know, by the looks of the chat, that's, that's what a lot of us are feeling, right? Um, there's a lot of unknowns right now. But similar to Andrea and Javier, San Carlos really feels like we've got very fun high functioning mechanisms in place. We are, um, you, we're trying to build that communication piece. So we've implemented an app called Zone to Grow, and that's a, an engagement tool, a daily engagement tool where students are checking in um, with their teacher academically, their goal setting, they're looking at um, how they're feeling. And so teachers, counselors, principals can all see this dashboard to really get a, their fingers on the pulse of what's going on. Our counselors have book me links and those are being utilized heavily by, by parents, by students and by staff. So they know how to access these resources. Um, we're also really excited because we're, for the first time, um, we are going to implement a universal mental health screening tool, which we hope will just give us a little more information about what students are needing so that we can, can use our resources wisely. Um, we're expanding our suicide prevention services to include 
a program called Friend Friend for our middle school students um, to really help them build capacity around how to have those motivational interviewing questions. And on the parent side, parent education side, we're going to be enhancing our parent green folder. And I think that was linked in the chat um, earlier too, but these are great resources that the healthcare district has helped us develop. And um, we just have a lot of gratitude for that and feel like it, it is definitely making a difference. Great, thank you so much, Mindy. Um, our next uh, panelist to introduce herself will be Kristen Sevilla, and to follow her, it will be Nell Curran. Thanks, Karen. Um, hello, I'm Kristen Sevilla. I am the Ed Services Wellness Coordinator for the Belmont Redwood Shores School District. Um, unfortunately, I have some unstable internet connection, so hopefully I will um, get through to the end of this without freezing in time. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, uh, this is my second year in this role, and I've been in education about 20 years, come from a family of educators, and it's, um, I never thought or dreamed that I could have this position. And um, I've thoroughly enjoyed being here because of um, what I get when I took on my role, um, what was already established within the district with the, the help and the support of the Sequoia Healthcare District and the Healthy Schools Initiative. Um, we're very fortunate in Belmont Redwood Shores to be well equipped to meet the varying needs um, the varying uh, social, emotional, and mental health needs of our students, TK through eighth grade. Um, we, at the middle school level, have four middle school counselors um, who work together to align their practices across the sites um, to ensure that our middle schoolers are getting those um, really good connections made with the adults on campus and that um, they know that they're seen and they're heard and they know where to go when they just need um, some of that extra emotional support. Um, we also are really fortunate to have two mental health therapists who work uh, very closely with our middle school counselors and um, are there to provide the support for our students with the, the most um, severe mental health needs. And then at the elementary level, um, we have a wonderful partnership with One Life Counseling. Um, we have uh, one of their associates in every, we have six elementary schools. Um, so we've been working with them to build out a robust counseling system um, that really gets their counselors into the classrooms and builds relationships with the students and also supports the teachers in um, delivering those weekly second step lessons. Uh, second step is our social emotional learning curriculum um, that we adopted years ago. Um, so we are able to really meet the needs of the students and um, because we've had the support um, for years and we've been um, really working on um, solidifying our whole child uh, model in Belmont Redwood Shores that as we reopened and relaunched the school year, um, everybody came to it from a place of relationship building and really taking the time to make sure that our students are transitioning to school um, in a way that um, meets their needs and is recognizing of when they need a little bit extra TLC and, and being able to, to provide that support to them. Um, we're really lucky that we have a new superintendent who firmly believes that we are better together and has really paved the way for us to focus on those um, relationships. And with that in conjunction with the support that we receive from the healthy school districts, um, the healthy school initiatives, um, we're really moving forward. Uh, we also have a great partnership with our, um, our Education School Foundation, who um, has helped to support the, the needs of our parents in providing parent education. So it's been really exciting to, um, to start off the school year knowing that everybody believes so deeply in meeting the needs, that the mental health and the social emotional needs of our students. Excellent. Thank you, Kristen, for that summary. 
Um, next is Nell Curran, followed by Chris Arrington. Hi everyone, um, my name is Nell Curran. I'm the wellness coordinator at the Las Lomitas Elementary School District, along with two nurses, two psychologists, two counselors, and all of our administrators. We serve about 1,400 students in our K through eight district. In regards to student mental health, we provide um, more preventative focused lessons and activities for all of our students in and out of the classroom. We have systems in place where we refer our students, those who are in distress or disengaged or who are otherwise struggling both academically and socially, social emotionally um, to our counselors. Our counselors um, then can provide uh, support to students in a one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting. And the counselors can then refer students to the Adolescent Counseling Services, um, which is a partnership um, that we have on site that provides um, additional support and more acute support to our middle school students. Um, Kia Ravi is on tonight. Um, welcome her and she'll be able to, to speak more to, to um, her role. So I'm glad to be here tonight and to hear from all of you and for all of us to share our best practices and strategies for how we can move forward to build a strong community for ourselves and our students. Thank you very much, Nell. Um, next, we have Chris Arrington, followed by Abby Keen. Hi, um, I'm Chris Arrington. I am the wellness coordinator and mental health lead in Menlo Park. Um, first off, what else can 2020 bring? It's like it's one thing after another. It just never stops. Um, when, over the summer, one of the there's two things that really happened. Um, we really started with the nursing piece of really thinking about um, what kind of safety things need to be put in place to address COVID coming into school that was dealing with the safety. But then the other piece in regards to the mental health that we really, um, in, in the school district, we really wanted to address was taking to the self-care of teachers because the teachers need to take care of themselves before they can take care of the kids. It's kind of like putting the mask on. But the other piece was um, making, trying to figure out how we can flip the education upside down and make school be as normal, that's a weird word to say right now, but as normal as it can um, with all those, those exciting things that happen when the kids come to school, you know, hanging out at recess, doing all those fun little things, being at the TV station, um, being in class, being social. So um, we spent a lot of times with the teachers at the beginning of the year and continuing now trying to flip a lot of those activities that we normally did into the school. We really felt the teachers have the biggest impact on the kids um, that they're working with. A couple of things that we've, been, we've, we've really worked on in making it more digital is in our elementary school. They've had things where they would have team time and they would get together and do socials and walk around schools. They would have their own town hall meetings, you know, their classroom meetings. Um, they would also, these are a lot of things that they would do to build communities. Um, our middle school, they really pushed that it was real important at the beginning of the day to get started. All the staff in the school um, connects with like 15 kids for the first 15 to 30 minutes of the school day, just, just to talk about silly things, put silly hats on and and have um, you know spirit days and and also do they throw in a lot of SEL kind of lessons you know big pieces that you don't have to, we our big thing was you don't have to have a big program but if you're just talking about it that's a big program in of itself um, we have counselors in each of our school sites uh, we have uh, three elementary schools and we have counselors each in the, each of the elementaries and um, we have three counselors in our middle school. And they've also flipped it too and continue their, their programs that they, they push out in the school. Our, one of our elementary counselors does the Zoom things that she goes on and does her little puppet shows with kids and continues to do that and talks with the kindergartners, making them what, feel welcome. Um, and also a couple of our schools have really pushed out their, um, their, their school TV shows that they would do. And, and in those shows, they really talk about building community and they do a lot of social emotional lessons. So that's really been the big push at the start of the school year. Um, it's, it's, it's always never enough because there's always something else you can do, but it's really the big push for us in Menlo Park was trying to, to flip it. So that way we're trying to make school um, fun for the kids. And, and also in Menlo Park too is like in the last couple of weeks, actually we're just so we're bringing our kinder, first 
kindergarten and first graders back in a couple of weeks with a waiver. So again, that just changed a lot of things that we were doing, which is fantastic for those kids because um, I know a lot of a lot of calls I've gotten from a lot of those parents are like, my kindergartner cannot be on Zoom, which you know, it's kind of one of those things that we've always said, less screen time, but now we have a lot of screen time. So anyways, it's a lot more to, to, to happen, but um, it's, it's been a really nice start to the year. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, next, we have Abby Keene, who will be followed by Kristen Shima. Hi, uh, my name's Abby Keene. I am a public health nurse, school nurse. I'm a wellness coordinator in Woodside and also a school nurse in Portola Valley. So for those of you who don't know that area, Woodside Elementary is a one school school district and Portola Valley is a two school school district. So they're very small, very small schools. Um, in Woodside, we're a, we're a K-8 school, elementary school serving about 400 kids. Um, we're really fortunate. We have a counselor, we have a psychologist, and also our special ed director was our former psychologist. So um, most of us know our community very well because we've been there, most of us, more than five years. Um, our approach at Woodside is a multidisciplinary approach. We try, to, we try to work together as a team. We're so small that everybody's in one large room. So um, if there is an issue with a child, pretty much you know, every, everybody knows, which is sometimes really wonderful and sometimes uh, not, especially if you're really busy. Um, so as a public health nurse, I work to coordinate medical care with mental health needs um, because we're really trying to make this a team approach at Woodside. Um, we've recently developed a, a care team, which is similar to an SST team, but it's where we develop an actual more of like a mental health care plan for some of our more high risk kids. Um, and you, as you know, a lot of these mental health issues overlap with um, medical issues. Um, Woodside in general over the past eight years has been very involved in SEL and prevention education. Um, we have pretty much trained every single staff member. Um, we've even sent our custodians to SEL training. We, we pride ourselves on we are an SEL school. Um, as far as mental health this year, I mean we're recently getting kicked off in all of our mental health work, but um, like Chris, uh, we already have uh, a vulnerable population on our campus, which has been interesting because these kids are uh, small groups. Um, we're really getting to know them very, very well, like six or seven kids in a classroom. But also before we really addressed our mental health needs, what we found out when we first came back, actually before we came back, is we really needed to meet some of just the basic needs of our kids, including rent, groceries. Um, there was a whole group of kids that were going to lose their homes or they had to move in with relatives. And so we worked with our, um, we have a group called the Woodside Inclusion Diversity Council. We worked with um, and partnered with our town and other personal individuals within Woodside to assist those families to make sure that they could get back to school and feel good about coming back to schools. And really those are our vulnerable learners. As far as mental health is concerned, um, referrals um, and accessing care, our counselor and our site put up a website with a mailbox. Um, kids can access them at any time. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, they did have quite a few seventh and eighth graders that just reached out to them because it was via email and they could just talk back and forth, which, um, which was kind of fun because they said those kids would have never talked to them at school. Uh, but typically if there's an issue, um, you know, a parent calls a counselor or a teacher will notify a counselor and um, we'll work with those kids. But as I said before, we're, we're kind of dealing with our, our vulnerable kids right now and trying to put together a little program for them um, for the next three weeks. Thank you very much, Abby. Um, next, we have Kristen Shima, followed by Todd. Great, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Kristen Shima. I'm actually principal of Corte de Madera School in Portola Valley School District. And as Abby mentioned, she's also our school nurse. 
Uh, we are a very small school district serving less than probably 600 kids. We have two schools, a K-3 school and a 4-8 school, and we are very fortunate to have a full-time counselor at each site along with a full-time district psychologist. And just want to give a shout out and a big thank you to Pamela and Karen for continuing to support the school districts, especially Portola Valley specifically around the areas of counseling and nursing and also the professional development that the healthcare district provides um, to our staff around mental health needs and also equity and diversity. Um, in terms of mental health supports. I just came out of a board meeting about 40 minutes ago where our board um, was looking at our goals for this current school year. And front and center with our school district, which is very similar to Woodside, is our social emotional learning program. Um, it is a selling point, as one board member said, in our school district, along with our counseling support. And um, the board needed to make sure and wanted to make sure that that was front and center in the goals for this year. And specifically in distance learning and virtual learning, focusing on self-care with our students and self-advocacy and just the emotional well-being of our kids in a virtual setting. Um, we have, I, I am an administrator, but the way our school district runs our wellness program is we have a team approach and it's made up of myself and our two counselors and our school psychologist. We call ourselves the wellness champions. We meet monthly and discuss students and health needs. And um, I'm going to throw it over to Todd in just a minute, but I want to just say that, that what we're doing right now, similar to Woodside, is we are bringing back our most vulnerable learners and our most vulnerable students, and that's starting next Wednesday. And we have three stable cohorts coming back, and they're not just kids that have academic, academic needs, but they're also kids that have mental health needs. And so our two uh, full-time counselors and psychologists will be on site on those Wednesdays to meet with those students. Um, and so we're really looking forward to getting those kids back. It's not through the waiver. It's um, second through eighth graders are coming back starting next Wednesday. <laughs> learners. So at this point, I'm going to throw it over to our fabulous counselor, Todd Patterson, and he's going to just talk a little bit about our social emotional learning approach, which is the backbone in our district of making sure that our students um, stay connected and how we kind of manage um, the needs of those students and he does a fantastic job. So I'll throw it over to Todd. Thank you, Kristen. Um, yeah, my name is Todd. I'm the counselor at Corte Madera School and I've been there about eight years. And um, I was really impressed when I came to the district because SEL was a really part of the culture before I even got there. And it says a lot about what Kristen's done for the, for the school district. And uh, we don't use one approach to SEL. And what I mean by that is we don't have one canned program. And those are good for some districts, but we wanted to do something that fits our community um, and is very specific, tailor-made for our individual needs. And a few years back, Kristen developed um, or created the Climate Committee. It's comprised of students and also faculty. And I think that was a really great starting point for a solid SEL program because you get to find out where kids are at and what they're thinking and what trends are on campus. So that really was sort of the fuel behind when I came to Corte Madera, how I would really use and, and create a SEL program that was complete and um, it supported the whole uh, child. Um, currently, we use the CASEL standards and we're working and it's district um, supported, the board uh, supports this. And there are different standards and CASEL is just the big organization that um, is really the, 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 the sort of the, the hubbub of all the SE or L world. And they really um, basically support research-based programs. And we're really focusing on self-awareness and self-management right now. Um, the school psychologist and I had a chance in the spring and some of you might've attended. Um, it was a state um, first um, aid uh, mental health training and there were like three or four of them and they were there were, there was a lot of very good information but taking some of that information and then taking some of how our students were feeling at the time when we went on distance learning and looking at the needs we felt that those were the best places to start with the self-awareness and self-management so i push into the uh, fourth and fifth grade classrooms live every week and um, then I uh, record a video um, SEL lesson for our middle school. And um, this week we're, we're just talking about feelings and emotions and tying it back to 
you know, we've talked about feelings and emotions since kindergarten. Why are we still talking about it? And it's a really important um, question to ask adolescents right now because sometimes they'll roll their eyes. And uh, I'm real. I know they're going to do that, and sometimes they do. But when you flip it back, well, why do you think we're doing this? What do you think, you know, is the benefit of this? It's really interesting to hear their answers. And so I'm very fortunate that I get a lot of these responses live because I'm in the classroom. And um, we also, part of our SAL program, again, we want to fit, um, fit the program to each student, if possible. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one counseling, a lot of one-on-one -on -one check on check-ins. It's not just me doing this, it's me, but we also have a great school psychologist, Lisa Sigliano. If somebody's more comfortable with her, they can work with her. We've even had situations where now Kristen is the principal, yay, but she was a vice principal last year, and maybe the student is more comfortable with Kristen. So I think that says a lot about our district. Um, sometimes kids won't mesh with you know, a particular person, no fault of either party, but um, it's just the way we are. And so we have a lot of different options. So again, we do a lot of one-on-ones, we do group if needed, and, and we do classrooms. Um, I think that one thing, because obviously this distance learning is just a, was a huge overhaul. Um, and there's been a lot of negativity with that, with you know, a lot of stress added for students and parents. But I have to say from a mental health standpoint, there has been a good thing that's come of it. I have easier access to parents um, Google Meet is wonderful because a lot of times when you're working with kids, and I think this is something that we really have to, you know, pay attention to, um, when you're working with a child, or if you want to call them an identified patient, I don't even like to use those terms, but um, when you're working with a child, generally they're a product of their environment, meaning they're part of a system. So I can help that child so much, but it really helps to have mom and dad involved or grandma or grandpa or whoever's living in the house and take a systems approach. And the distance learning um, has really allowed me to do that more. And I know it's allowed my colleagues to do it more as well. So um, anyways, I could talk on and on and on just about what we're doing and I'm really excited about it. And um, I'm pleased in the direction we're headed. Thank you, Todd. Um, next in the lineup of panelists, we have Susie Hughes. And after Susie will be Anna Paula. Hi, uh, thank you so much for uh, spending your night with us. It, it's, it's great to see all this interest in mental health. I am Suzanne Hughes. I'm the executive director of One Life Counseling Center. And we're a newer nonprofit in San Carlos. And we currently work uh, in the Redwood City School District, San Carlos School District, Belmont Redwood Shores, a little bit in San Mateo, and up in San Francisco. Um, we're just uh, thrilled that mental health has become what it has become in the last few years. I think it's become so much more destigmatized and so much more accessible with the help of Sequoia Healthcare District and just the school districts buying in fully uh, to really uh, wrapping around the students and their needs. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things about who we are as a program. So we provide uh, school-based services. We have three different lines of service, if you will. We have the Resiliency Program, which is supported by Sequoia Healthcare District and the Atkinson Foundation, where we go into the classroom and pair with the teacher in tandem to certain classrooms that have been identified as higher risk and have a therapist embedded in, in services. We also have a trauma program, and that's uh, targeted to mostly immigrant students. Newcomers is the federal term that we use for them, uh, where we uh, do specialized groups and figure out different uh, needs, get to know the students during those eight weeks, teach some skills, and identify uh, other social services that they need, and really follow uh, those students and ensure that they're doing okay in school, emotionally, and their families' needs are met. Um, the third is just individual counseling and SEL in the classroom. So we also provide that in, in different schools. Uh, we, we do uh, counseling. And so our mission is really low fee, affordable services, access for everyone. So uh, anybody is free to call us at any time and we will uh, make sure they get uh, treatment. We accept Medi-Cal and Kaiser and we'll see people for um, no fee if necessary. So we're here to help the community. We do food distribution every other Friday and um, we're, we're available for anybody to utilize our services. So it's great to be here. It's um, great to see so many partners on this phone call and it's great to see that there's so many participants who care about mental um, mm -hmm. health in our community. So thank you for that. Thanks, Karen. 
Thank you, Susie. Um, next, we have Anna Paula, and to follow Anna Paula will be Alexandra. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Paula. My pronouns are she, hers, and I am from Star Vista. I am the program manager for our school-based services and oversee five of our programs, providing mental health services to students in 35 elementary, middle, and high schools throughout San Mateo County. The five programs that fall under school-based services are the Child and Family Resource Center, Strengthen Our Youth, School-Based, Children's Place, and the Youth Development Initiative. All of our clinicians are really embedded within the schools and in constant communication with the school staff in order to identify students that are needing services and could benefit from mental health services. Referrals for our services can be initiated by the students themselves, teachers, or parents. Um, and they, we are able to provide students with check-ins, crisis assessments, group therapy, workshops, ongoing individual therapy, and family therapy as needed. All of these are at no cost to the students or families through their schools. Uh, currently, we're only providing electronic mental health services just because the students aren't at school, but we are in constant communication with all of our schools and districts to determine the safest way to provide in-person services whenever it's determined that it is safe again. So because we are in so many schools throughout the county, the best way to identify if there's a Star Vista clinician at a child's school is to really just check in with the teacher or the principal. They'll know if there's a Star Vista clinician available to them. And then once, if it's a yes, then that teacher or principal can potentially put you, the parent, or a community member in touch with the clinician and kind of go from there in terms of a referral. If there is no Star Vista clinician at that school, we do have a counseling center with Star Vista that is able to provide individual and family therapy on an ongoing basis. They do Medi-Cal and sliding scale. And the information for the counseling center will be passed along in a resource list at the end of this meeting. So last year, we were able to connect with over 2,600 students in the 2019-2020 school year. And we're really excited to be able to keep that going this school year. Thank you, Anna Paula. Um, next on the list, we have Alexandra. And to follow her will be Casia. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I love working for Acknowledge Alliance and I love our awesome school district that we work with and the Sequoia Health District. It's been such a joy to work here. So I'm a transition therapist. I'm a mental health clinician who works in three different high schools in the Sequoia Union High School District and we have clinicians all over the Sequoia Union High School District. So we started out treating adolescents who were coming out of juvenile hall or on probation and we've really broadened our scope. So now we treat any adolescent in those schools who's struggling with anxiety, depression, PTSD, disordered eating, self-harm, you name it, <laughs> we will see them. All of these services are also for free for students while they are currently attending um, Sequoia Union High School District. So I, you could see somebody from their freshman year all the way until their senior year. Um, and then we also provide services in the Boys and Girls Club in Redwood City and then Peninsula Bridge College Prep Program. And then we have our Resilience Consultation Program, which does social emotional learning um, and assessments in schools all through San Mateo County. We also provide really comprehensive psychological assessments. So we really want to focus on the holistic picture um, of the student we're working with. So we take into consideration things like psychological, medical, cultural, environmental, and other factors. Um, if any of our clients have a psychiatrist or a pediatrician that they work with closely, we try to be involved in that as well so that we're making sure that we're really um, giving them the best care and being able to give them the most uh, efficient and comprehensive um, assessment possible and really targeting the mental health treatment and the treatment plan to their individual um, needs. And we do provide weekly individual therapy. Uh, depending on the student, we can provide bi-weekly, depending on the intensity. Um, we also provide group therapy in some of our schools. Um, and then sometimes we provide case management services and dyadic work with the parents if we need to at any point. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And um, next will be Casia. Good evening, everyone. And thanks to the Sequoia Healthcare Districts for sponsoring this event and to all of you for joining. 
So I'm Casey Aravi, pronouns she, her, hers from Adolescent Counseling Services, also known as ACS. And I currently manage ACS's school-based program at La Entrada Middle School and was previously a therapist for ACS at Woodside High School. So just a little more about us, Adolescent Counseling Services or ACS is a mental health organization that's been around for 45 years. Um, and as our name would suggest, we're specifically targeted to supporting and empowering youth as well as their families and communities in terms of their mental health. And ACS currently implements four core programs in San Mateo County and Santa Clara County. So one is our on-campus counseling program and all of these I'll speak more about. Um, our adolescent substance abuse treatment program, outlet, which is our LGBTQ program, um, and then our community counseling program. So our on-campus program, what I love about it is that it removes the barriers of access and cost by providing school-based counseling to any student that uh, might benefit from that. And we can work with them for as long as needed. Uh, so um, very similar to the sorts of things you just heard from Acknowledge and Alliance, um, school-based, usually individual, but also some group counseling, uh, working with parents, crisis intervention, mental health education. And we have long standing partnerships in the schools I mentioned, as well as other schools and youth centers in the region. Our adolescent substance abuse treatment program is a harm reduction outpatient treatment program, and it's specifically geared towards treating adolescents st struggling with substance use. And we do that by engaging families in the process of treatment. And um, we have wonderful support groups for teens, as well as parents of those teens or caregivers and we provide community prevention education around substance use. Outlet is a wonderful program that empowers lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning youth and their families and allies, and builds safe and accepting communities with its support group counseling, leadership training, and community education. We work closely with schools and a number of other um, groups throughout the, the communities around here. And then finally, our community counseling program is open to anyone, any youth and their families. Um, and that, through that, we offer individual and family therapy on a sliding scale and uh, afternoon or evening hour appointments. So just in terms of kind of our overall reach, simply put, every year, ACS, I'm really proud to say, is saving lives of kids in our communities. Um, we've seen that youth through our programs have ended their use of drugs and alcohol decrease their feelings of anxiety, depression, isolation, which is huge right now with everything that's been going on under COVID, um, increase their grades and improve their all, overall social and emotional well-being. So um, thank you for joining us. And if you'd like to learn more about us, our link will be provided in the resources you'll get after this evening. Excellent, thank you, Casia. Um, well, that rounds out our panel, and um, this is an impressive collection of, of folks. And I just wanna mention, whenever I talk about the Healthy Schools Initiative to colleagues across the state or across the country, everybody is so impressed with this amazing team that we have. So next, I'm gonna hand off the microphone back to Charlene, and we'll launch into our, our question period. Well, hi again, everybody. I want to say, first of all, I'm always impressed by Sequoia Healthcare District, and I'm proud to be one of the organizations that they represent and help fund. And again, there's been a lot of nice comments in the um, chat about the parent education series. Just real briefly, I want to say that we are an entirely grassroots program started 15 years ago at Menlo Atherton High School with 25 people in the library. And today, 15 years later, we've had over 85,000 attendees. And we owe a lot of that to our partnership with the Sequoia Healthcare District, gave us our first little grant. Thank you, Pamela Kurtzman. And we are here today working with most of the districts in the community and looking forward to more partnerships. So I'd like to start out before we go to some specific targeted questions. There's a few questions that came in earlier that are a little bit more generalized. And I think that, Karen, you can help me field who might be the best person to answer these. But let's, let's try, or, or please, panelists, feel free if you have a specific take on these questions, okay? Here is the one that came in early in the program. Do you find that the mental health service gap is narrowing in your district? 
the mental health service gap is narrowing in your district. People are thinking. I think I'd like to start with Javier on that one. All right, um, in terms of the mental health gap narrowing, I think uh, as another uh, speaker or someone else pointed out that really the awareness and, and the destigmatization of it has uh, increased. And so with that, uh, I think we have more students that feel comfortable reaching out and accessing support. So it actually might look like uh, we have more students accessing service, which is great because it doesn't mean uh, that the need wasn't there before. It just means that um, perhaps either the, the need has increased, um, but also that it's more accessible and it's more um, acceptable, I guess, to stay, to, to put it that way, for our students to access it. So in terms of the gap, if we're referring to um, the gap between the, the number of students that need it and the support that they are receiving, I would say uh, it's, it has decreased because uh, we see that more students are reaching out and accessing that. That doesn't mean we can't do more. That doesn't mean we don't have uh, the opportunity to provide more support or um, that we don't have additional students that we still need to identify or uh, to provide support for. But I think that we do have, uh, we, we are closing that gap a little bit through uh, events like this. Also uh, with professional development for our staff that was uh, mentioned across the different school districts here. So increasing that awareness so that our students can potentially get that support, uh, what we call tier one. So at the first, like the initial level that they might be interacting with the teacher in a classroom, rather than having to seek out a specific therapy. So before it gets to that point, um, we have the opportunities through social and emotional learning or just creating positive learning environments to support our students with that. Um, also, we have, I'll say at least at Sequoia Union High School District, we have a wellness advisory council uh, that continues to identify areas where we can close this gap. And uh, I'm sure our other school districts have something similar. And I encourage uh, anyone in the public that's here to um, find the opportunity to get involved and, and support your school district as I do recognize that uh, some of them are here tonight and I appreciate it. Um, so that's, that's my take on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Javier. Karen, did you have something else to add? Well, I just wanted to find out if there were any others that would like to follow up on that. Yeah, I'd like to, to just add to what Javier said. Um, I think something that that we're also seeing is that the priority is being placed on the emotional needs and support of our children. And that I think collectively as, a, as an education community and as a parent community, and as the community at large, we're all recognizing that um, academics alone are not going to produce well-rounded um, adults. And that what we're seeing is a call to action. And I think after listening to what all the districts are doing um, to support SEL and mental health. Um, I feel like it's not necessarily the gap is narrowing, but that we're becoming more robust and more um, intentional in how we serve the, those needs of our students. Thank you, Kristen. You know, again, as Pamela mentioned in the beginning, everybody here reminds us as a group that the Healthy Schools Initiative is a very holistic program that what we're trying to do is create a climate of change and a climate of care for all of the students in our districts. And this combination of the healthcare district, the wellness leads, the mental health providers, programs like mine that work directly with parents, we're all in this together. And I think that you can really feel that from everybody that's speaking today. Uh, here's a timely question that came in from a community member. And again, anybody here who's in the town hall that has a question, please feel free to type it into the chat, okay? So here we go. And again, this one I'm going to, I'm not going to give this to somebody in specific, but I'll bet that somebody has some important input. We haven't talked too much today about social justice issues or the Black Lives Matter movement. How do you or how do we as districts help students become more aware of the emotional vulnerability of marginalized youth? Social justice, helping, helping students become more aware 
a marginalized youth? Anybody? Can I answer? Sure can, Alexandra. <laughs> Great. So um, most of the students that we serve at Acknowledge Alliance come from some marginalized population in some way. And that's a big part of our assessment process. So we ask them about what are parts of their cultural background that are really important to them, which can include anything. It can include race or gender or gender identity or religion, anything that's part of their cultural identity. So that's a big part of the process. And we like to weave it into the entire treatment plan rather than just have it as like an add on something at the end. It's something that we do in all of the treatment. And we also really have a restorative justice outlook. So we work with the principals, the assistant principals, the school nurse, whomever, to really discuss like how can we provide this particular student or client with not only restorative justice, but also the interactions on the day to day that they might need to heal some of that trauma. But um, speaking I think more to the question of like, how do we inform more students about that? I think because the populations that we see at Acknowledge Alliance really are from marginalized communities. That's, that's, um, we're not really informing other students because the students we see are, they're experiencing it. So we're working with the trauma and the experience and the entire school system, which has been really wonderful. All of the principals, all of the staff um, at Sequoia Union High School District are amazing. That's their outlook too. They're ready to soak up all that information and really promote change within the, their school. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Alexandra. Here's a question that I'm going to direct to Andrea Guerin from the Redwood City School District. Andrea, are you with me? I'm here. You're here. Okay. <laughs> this is a question that I think is really relevant to every parent. How do parents connect with the schools about mental health support for our kids when they're learning at home? Well, in Redwood City, we've very successfully been able to share a link to a Google form where parents can request um, counseling services and support. Um, that's worked really well for us. We've published it in numerous letters that it goes out in the superintendent's newsletter. It goes out to principals. It goes out to teachers as well to share with parents. And um, it provides a very discreet way for parents to just jot down in a Google form what they're concerned about, where their child is at school, and then we follow up. Um, I will say that adding to that, there is a note at the top of the form that says that if you're experiencing an emergency, this is not, this is not the, the method. So we also are providing uh, the Star Vista crisis line number to parents and we're doing that also directly through our um, classrooms where um, recently we have shared that number so that that can be shared um, as directly as possible um, to some of our families um, through their classroom platform. Mostly that's at middle school, otherwise it's through the principals to parents. So that has been um, one of the best ways that we have found, and of course a principal can always, I'm sorry, a parent can also always reach out to their site administrator, and then the site administrator would know how to set them up for the referral process. So the form just allows them to do it more easily, um, and as I mentioned, discreetly. Thank you, Andrea. All right, I'm going to ask a question to um, Susie Hughes, the Executive Director of One Life Counseling Center in San Carlos. Susie, this is a question, again, that I think is a really important one. My husband and I both work full time, but we need help. How do I get a family therapist? What do I do? That's a great question. And a lot of people are so stretched for times um, and they're during the day, they're homeschooling and are virtually assisting their kids in the learning process. So um, there's many agencies, some here and um, One Life as well, that you, you are free to call. You can look at our website, you'll get our referral number, but you can call us at any time and we can see you. As far as school-based services, uh, a lot of our therapists, this is one of the beautiful things about COVID is that they're available in the evenings as well. And so if there needed to be a family session that was tied to a student at a certain school, that they, they could provide that uh, as well from uh, at least our agency can. Um, 
and not everybody is working after hours, but some of our therapists are. So that's another way to access those services, which is great. And I think I just, uh, you know, the disparity between those who can access service and those who can't has grown greatly with um, just people that have to work, uh, essential workers. And so flexible hours, I know many agencies have, have really increased their uh, accessibility and, and that's been super helpful. All right, and here's a related question for Anna Paula from Star Vista. What if my child is having a mental health crisis either, and this is related to what Susie just mentioned, after hours or on the weekend? What do I do if I can't get in touch with their school? Yeah, so we know that student mental health issues don't solely fall during school hours when they have the most amount of resources available to them. So we do have the San Mateo Crisis Center, which is run by Star Vista. It is available 24 seven. The number which will be passed along in the resource list. We also have a crisis chat for youth that is available Monday through Thursday from 4.30 to 9 p.m. So after school in the evenings, they can hop on and chat with someone in real time if they don't feel comfortable hopping on the phone. That website is onyourmind.net. It will also be included on the resource list. Um, schools can, school administrators can also feel free to call our crisis line, or, line and consult. Um, if they're trying to do a crisis assessment during school hours with a client and they just kind of have some questions about what next steps would be, what questions to ask, the crisis center does a lot of consultations with schools, whether it be teachers or principals. So it's a great um, resource to use if you just have any question about uh, a student's safety. Thank you, Anna Paula. Really great information. All right, this question is for Kristen Sevilla from the Belmont Shores Redwood City School District. And this is one I know is much on everybody's minds because we know how hard teachers are working and how important they have been during COVID-19. How is the district supporting the mental health of the teachers and staff? Yes, thank you. Um, I think back in probably you know March 14th is when we we realized that um, this was a big undertaking um, for all the adults in the building, um, supporting and educating the students. And as we um, we've spent years really focusing on, on the whole child, building out our programs and making sure we have a robust system to beat the, meet the, the SEL and mental health needs of the students. And um, I think one of the positives that have come out of, of um, the pandemic is it's really making us think about if we're supporting the whole child, we also need to make sure that the adults supporting the children um, have their needs met. And um, just, I've been very fortunate um, in Belmont Redwood Shores um, to have a district leader, our superintendent, who, um, whose whole focus this year is building relationships um, and really sending the message and living the message that we're better together, um, modeling that. And we had a lot of discussions about, you know, what does that look like in the schools? Like, how do we do that? We can't just provide all the support to the teachers who need it so much. We have to think about the people who are supporting the teachers, which are our site, site administrators. Um, so I spent this summer um, just really diving in, um, having um, great conversations with, uh, with uh, Karen, um, who's been a great thought partner and collaborator in talking through this whole idea of what does employee wellness mean these days? Um, you know, typically it's been a yoga class that, that has been offered for free for teachers and um, which is a great perk to have, but right now our teachers need more than yoga. Um, so in Belmont Redwood Shores, uh, we have been working with our site administrators in um, creating amongst them a support unit and um, being intentional and transparent with them in, into thinking about how are, how are they supporting not only the students, but their staff. What are those things that we can do to um, ensure that the teachers and the staff feel and, and are, feel that they're heard and they feel seen? Um, and from there, um, it's just, it's been a lot of work. There's a lot of plans um, that are, are being laid. Um, really thinking about how are we building community with our, our teachers and our staff when we're not all in the same building together. Um, how are we keeping those connections alive and how are we supporting teachers 
um, when they're having those moments of just, you know, like our students, what do you do when they're feeling despair or when they're feeling frustration and overwhelming? Um, our school force, our Ed Foundation, um, has been partnering also with us and thinking about how we can support the teachers. Um, but I think the, the big turning point is the, the support that we have from the healthcare district. Um, because of the leadership at the district, because of the leadership uh, between Pamela and Karen um, at, in the healthcare district, really believing that we, we do need to care about the employees. Um, we're moving forward with, um, it, with uh, I call it a social emotional learning community of practice. And um, it's an invitation to teachers uh, we've had our first one. The second one is being put on the calendar as we speak. Um, but it's a place for the teachers to come together to, um, to talk about social emotional learning and um, not only for the students, but for themselves. And it's a safe place for them to connect with one another and to hopefully um, end that time together feeling that they've been seen and heard by their community and by their, um, their peers and that they can they can um, continue to do their work. So um, really the focus within Belmont Redwood Shores is all on relationships and, um, and making sure that those relationships right now are being strengthened and not um, diminished. Thank you, Kristen. That makes us all feel better. All right, this question is for Nell Curran in the Las Lomitas Elementary School District. Nell, this is a question that many parents have. I wonder what your response would be. If my child is showing signs of anxiety or sad, sadness, what steps do I take to get help? Well, as Andrea said, we, um, so we have a sort of system of communication where we encourage parents um, to communicate with their teachers, We're usually sort of the, in contact with them on a regular basis and just sort of the first line of, um, line of defense for the students. So we encourage parents to communicate with the, the teachers or administrators or directly with our counselors and our flow. We have a process that um, our teachers are informed of um, to raise um, issues that families see um, to the counselors and the counselors can then work with the students uh, as I mentioned before one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting students can actually contact the counselors themselves too um, so the referral process to the counselors is really um, open for anyone who finds that they are struggling um, that they're feeling um, whether it's academics or social emotional health that they're needing support um, and then the counselors then refer students who need additional support to our uh, ACS services. Um, and we also have, uh, our counselors have reached out to parents, our principals have been holding uh, coffees, same with our uh, superintendent. So we're trying to make the team more visible to parents uh, so that folks feel comfortable with who we are, uh, what all of our roles are, um, and that they can uh, reach out for, for help. Uh, Thank so. you, Nell. That's really important. Okay, this question is for Chris Her Arrington from the Menlo Park City School District. Chris, what mental health services does your school district provide? Well, um, in our district, we have counselors at each of the school sites. So um, they provide some of the counseling that goes on there. Um, a lot of SCL, a lot of tier, tier one, um, when you think of it. Um, I'm actually the mental health lead in the district, so I pro provide a lot of mental health counseling for, for many of the kids in our district as well, um, that I provide counseling. So that's a big piece. Um, but again, as I said, we have a counselor at each of the school sites, and we have three counselors at the middle school. And that's the, the, the first, first place where we really want to um, have the kids connect, because that's really, that's like their community, right? So you want to be able to push it there first um, and providing that kind of support. Thank you, Chris. Okay, Mindy Hill, this question is for you. Um, Mindy, I know you've been in this position for a long time. Can you tell us about what other programs are schools implementing to support students' mental health beyond counseling? Yes, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's a big, a big question. question. It really and and really the the great thing about that is that it 
points to how collaborative our community is. So, it, you know, the larger umbrella in San Mateo County, we're part of a school wellness alliance, which is convened by the San Mateo County um, Health System. And that brings all of us and the whole county together to look at these issues. So we have, um, over time, in partnership with the healthcare district and the County Office of Education, those three entities have really come along to create very robust programming to help build capacity in our teaching staff. Um, all kinds of programs. I mean, they really run the gamut. I'm, I'm blanking on, you know, listing them out right now, but um, hundreds and hundreds of teachers throughout the county have taken advantage of these workshops that we've put together and presentations. Um, several people have mentioned their school foundations. In San Carlos, our San Carlos Education Foundation has repeatedly matched um, funding for our, our curriculum and for our staffing um, around mental health. They've sponsored many, many parent education events, and they're, they're actually helping us partner with you, Charlene, in the Parent Education Series. Um, so that's a tremendous resource. Um, we have, we are, we are actually doing a lot with the Black Lives Matter movement and the social justice movement. So I was glad there was a question about that earlier. I think um, what that movement is doing is not just continuing to build the empathy that that our social emotional learning programs have built in the past, but really giving voice to, to people who are in marginalized positions and some focus on that to acknowledge um, the depth of that issue and the longevity of that issue, um, which has opened up a plethora of education opportunities. I know we had, what was it, close to 700 people on the call earlier this week with Dr. Rios. I think he's featured behind you, perhaps, on the poster. Um, and I feel like that, that the parent education that's taking place and the focus on curriculum around Black Lives Matter and anti-racism our focus on restorative justice and restorative practices, which some people have mentioned in the chat. Um, all of those things really wrap around to build a context that can move the whole community forward. Thank you. Mindy. I could go on and on. I know you could, thank you so much. So right now I'm going to kick it to Karen Lee to see if Karen, you and Pamela would like to make some concluding remarks. I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. We have about five or six minutes on the clock. Karen, I, I would like you to have a chance, you and Pamela to wrap up. If you think that there's time for one more lead, please let me know. Um, before we wrap up, I actually would like to give um, Kasia Ravi a chance to answer a question if there is one for her. Um, and then um, we can wrap up. Okay, hang on. Karen, why don't you talk for a minute about the Wellness Collaborative and I'll find a question for Casey. Yeah. Great, perfect. So to piggyback on Mindy's comments regarding the San Mateo County Health System as well as the San Mateo County Office of Education, I really see it as a three-legged stool and we all work together on these projects together and we, we march together to get to these goals. And so we're very thankful to those partners. I also wanna do a shout out to our, our um, colleagues in Santa Clara County. We have a couple of them on, a, on our, uh, our call and they've been um, chatting uh, some information that's very important. So I want to also appreciate, send our appreciation to our Santa Clara um, uh, 
uh, neighbors. And then um, lastly, there is a San Mateo County Mental Health Collaborative, which meets every month. Um, it follows our wellness team meetings, and it's an important um, uh, group that gets together to really discuss and, and drill down on the mental health needs in our community. So um, just an amazing kind of quilt of support that we have is um, exists in this county. And I'm just very grateful to have all of you on this call and to help educate our community. Well, thank you, Karen. And for those of you who don't know, Karen is actually a medical physician, former pediatrician, and also the former, well, former wellness director for the Sequoia Union High School District. So she comes to this work firmly with a foot in both worlds, and we really appreciate that about you, Karen. Thank you. All right, one last question for Casia, and then we're gonna hand it back to Pamela Kurtzman, the CEO. Casia, as a parent, what are signs that I should consider referring my child for school-based therapy? You may want to mention the green folder. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, super important question. And yes, everyone, please do check out that green folder. It's an amazing resource that the healthcare district has put together. And among other things, it includes signs that you should look for in terms of um, you know, knowing when to seek more help uh, for your child. So just to mention a few, if you see big changes in grades, big changes in sleep, either sleeping more, sleeping less, changes in mood like unprovoked anger, increased anxiety, kid seems more down, um, even apathy or being constantly bored, that can be a sign of depression. So, but take a look at the list and it'll be a great resource for you. Thank you. Thank you, Casey, a good advice. All right, Karen and Pamela, back to you. Okay, well, we have come such a long way and when I'm listening to all of this unbelievable work that is going on in our schools. And I think back to when I started this initiative 10 years ago, SEL, social emotional wellness, mental health was not even on the radar of our uh, school administrators. That was during a time of severe budget cuts. They were just trying to figure out how are they gonna keep math teachers employed and kids learning basic English. And then we're trying to tell them about how mental health and how physical health and well-being will help support their learning and they just couldn't quite grasp what that meant and um, and it took several years to really move this thing along but it's because of our people like like Mindy Hill who's been a wellness coordinator in San Carlos for nine years and Andrea Guerin even eight years now I mean, it's been, and the, the openness and the willingness of our school administrators and superintendents to say, yeah, I think we're onto something here. And, uh, and then all of our partners that we have here today, um, these incredible organizations that we've supported for years and years, and then just the ability to create that awareness and the dialogue around the importance of supporting our kids, our families, and our, and our, um, and our teachers. And so I just, I'm, I'm in awe of all this great work. And Dr. Lee has been an unbelievable staff member and, uh, and really taking these efforts to the next level. Um, and, uh, and Charlene, thank you and your fabulous team for uh, helping put on this town hall um, and for everybody's time and expertise and making it happen. Um, and for all of you uh, in the audience who are joining us, Thank you very much. You can always email me or, um, or Karen if you have other questions. Um, we're going to mm -hmm. save uh, the chat questions and can get back to everybody. Um, but it was great to have you all here and, uh, and enjoy your, your night. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Karen. As always, it is great for everyone to be together. Thank you to everyone who attended this first town hall. It is intended to be a series, so please do look for information about future town hall meetings hosted by the Sequoia Healthcare District. This event was recorded. There will be details about where that recording will reside, but it will definitely be on the Sequoia Healthcare District's website. So again, um, we will follow up with an email to all of you who registered with resources to everyone that you heard today, as well as some other additional links for things like the green folder and the parent education series. So again, Thank you to everyone. Thank you to Pamela Kurtzman and Karen Lee and my parent venture partner, Bev Hartman, for all the behind the scenes work. 
Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Stay safe and stay well. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone.